Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, bene benedictus tu mulieribus, e benedictus frutus ventis tu Iesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ali motis nostre. Amen. In nome di Dio, Figli e Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass as we said on this, the feast of Saint Dorothy, or Dorothea, Virgin and Martyr of Caesarea in Cappadocia. Uh, the modern city uh, still uh, bears that ancient name, though in Turkish it is uh, Kayseri, and uh, it is located in central Anatolia, so actually literally right in the middle of Turkey. According to tradition, St. Dorothy or Dorothea uh, was uh, a, a, a woman of noble birth uh, who was discovered uh, to be a Christian and was brought uh, for trial and sentencing to the governor Sericius or Sericius. She was uh, uh, given the opportunity uh, to renounce her faith in Christ and uh, burn uh, incense before uh, uh, an idol, uh, but this she refused and uh, declared herself uh, a consecrated virgin to Christ. She said that uh, uh, on her way to trial or at the trial, uh, a chap called uh, Theophilus uh, mocked her, uh, saying to her, uh, bring me uh, fruit from the Garden of Bliss uh, that you think you are going to. And after being uh, racked and still refusing to renounce Christ, she was sentenced to death. And whilst awaiting the execution, an angel appeared to her with a basket of three apples and three roses, which she commanded the angel to take to Theophilus. Theophilus was uh, apparently uh, in his garden uh, with a friend, continuing to mock the saint, when a young man appeared to him with the basket of fruit and roses and said to him, these are from Dorothy and the Garden of Bliss. So moved and uh, so moved was Theophilus that he immediately declared Christ as God and thereupon of course himself was tortured, arrested, tortured and died a martyr for Christ. All this said to have occurred around 311 AD toward the end of the persecution begun by Diocletian. We reflected yesterday on the feast of Saint Agatha, Virgin and Martyr of Rome, upon the nature of divine charity, of sacrificial love, and of its manifestation uh, in our Christian lives, especially with regard to issues of sex and sexual morality. We reflected on how uh, chastity itself is indeed a great act of sacrifice on our part. We all of us, my brothers and all, all most of us, uh, uh, understand uh, what uh, sex is and what uh, uh, sexual intimacy is. And most of us, if we were honest, would have to say that we are, are infected by that lustful concupiscence uh, that uh, clouds or uh, veils our appreciation of the world, but particularly of each other in a sexualized way. And we reflected how, as Christians, uh, we are called, if we're not necessarily called to a life of avowed celibacy, and certainly if we're not called to a life of faithfulness in uh, charity, in holy matrimony, then we are certainly, each and every one of us, called to a life of sacrificial chastity as an expression and a way of living in love with God and with each other. Now, another aspect to this is the way in which charity should enable us to regard the other appropriately as children of God. 
we as Christians, my brothers and sisters, should be able to look at other people and not as the world does, i.e. not then to sexu sexualize them or objectify them in some way, certainly not uh, to regard them lustfully, but instead to see with the eyes of faith and recognize that they are made like us in the image and likeness of our God. To recognize and to see them for a child of God. Now this language, my brothers and sisters, should be helpful to us. It should be helpful to us to remember to think of others as children of God. To remember to, uh, when we behold someone, to remind ourselves that we are beholding a child of God. And of course, connotations of innocence and purity and of course chastity come to mind when we think of children. That is why uh, we call uh, paedophilia uh, or hemophilia, why we call them perversions. Because they distort what ought to be the uh, natural appreciation of children, not as sexual beings or sexualized objects, but uh, as, as children, as young consciences. Remember what our Lord says about those who harm young consciences. It were better for them that a millstone were hung around their neck. And most of us, they are gracias, most of us are able to uh, are, are able to recognize children as children but the sadness the great sadness is of course that some among us are not able to do so and this has caused uh, uh, great pain and suffering uh, and hardship for many sadly even within the church we know, of course, who can possibly be ignorant of all that has come to light uh, uh, in the uh, Catholic Church uh, in recent years. But the same is sadly true of other confessions as well, of other Christian denominations, where a minority, praise God, a minority of men and women have unfortunately failed and indeed have harmed young consciences who indeed did not see and recognize the innocence and purity and chastity of youth or of innocent child uh, of, of the innocence of childhood um, but rather sought uh, to, to be smirched and despoiled but actually, in some ways, my brothers and sisters, we none of us ought uh, to think ourselves better who fall foul of uh, thinking in a similar way of adults. It is a great shame, my brothers and sisters, that innocency, that purity, that chastity, that virginity is so little regarded in our contemporary age, that it is so little regarded by society at large. It is a great shame that our young people <coughs> um, are obsessed with sexuality and sexualizing themselves and indeed are only too keen in popular culture to despoil themselves. And while, as we have reflected before, these are, you know, natural urges, as people are wont to say, we ought also to remember that not all that is natural is necessarily good. So often we hear people say, quoting Genesis, and God made this and <coughs> saw that it was good. Well, yes, indeed, in the first uh, moments of creation, 
all that God had created was good. It was inherently good. But then, of course, it became spoiled. Spoiled by the fall. Spoiled by sin. So that the natural order in our world today is not as it had been originally intended. As wondrous and as glorious as uh, the handiwork of God is that we can see and appreciate in the natural world around us even so, it is what we see is a pale version, a corrupted version, all of it marred by death. Beautiful things grow and bloom and then sadly die. But when first created in the Garden of Eden, all these things had an immortal or an eternal nature to them. And when the new heaven and the new earth come, when we are changed from this corruptible into an incorruptible form or mode of existence. So we will enjoy again what God had originally intended for humanity to enjoy. Eternal life. Immortality. But until such, until such time, we are here living, uh, those who are baptised as exiles. Exiled citizens from the kingdom of God. Living in this world which is imperfect. And ourselves living and coping with and enduring an imperfect existence. But one which we are able to endure because of the light of Christ. Because of the work of of restoration and reconciliation of creator with created begun and worked by Christ in his ultimate sacrifice of love upon the cross. For in him who was the perfection of the image and likeness of God, that is the mystery of the incarnation, restores within himself has begun the restoration of what God had originally intended for us to experience and to live. And those of us who hear the gospel of good news, who respond with love for love, we who then pursue after righteousness, right living with God, those of us who pursue after holiness, those of us who pursue after the manifestation of God's love in us, and for us begin within ourselves that process of restoration and reconciliation which will be fully realized when the new heaven and the new earth come when the kingdom of God is realized but with that promise with that our Christian hope are we able to endure in this life all the pains and tribulations and dichotomy that is the human experience or is the earthly experience at the present time. This constant battle between our spirit and our physical, both of which will of course be restored and reconciled in the new heaven and the new earth, but which in the meantime we might seek to reconcile within ourselves in this life so that we may experience for ourselves something of the life to come and may bear witness to others something of the life to come. And the way we do this is by putting on Christ, by striving to become Christ-like by striving to manifest within our lives the right way of thinking, the right way of seeing, the right way of feeling. 
And we can only achieve this by cooperating with God's grace, by availing ourselves of God's grace, by continually living with our hearts and our minds open to God's grace and by applying ourselves and cooperating with his grace. This is not a work of reconciliation within ourselves that we can achieve by ourselves, but only with God's grace. And this grace is afforded to us, particularly, of course, in the restorative sacraments, as we said yesterday, of penance and Eucharist. through which, despite our fragility, despite our weakness, despite our failings, we can be restored, healed and forgiven. We can have the slate made clean. We can begin again. We can strive again to live with innocence, in purity, in chastity, in true charity. Frequent recourse to the sacrament of penance, frequent reception of the most holy Eucharist, the sacrament of Christ's love. Itself the manifestation of that unicity in charity with the Trinity that is ultimately our destination and the purpose of our life and God's will for us. To become one with him in him and that through him and by him by the wondrous working of the sacraments of grace in our lives by the constant gift of his loving kindness and mercy poured upon us through the gift of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Holy Ghost to discern and to learn and to grow and to develop in grace. So that we might one day be greeted as Our Lady herself was by the Archangel. Hail thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And for as sure as Our Lady was an Ark of the Covenant, carrying in her womb the mystery of the Incarnation of Emmanuel God with us. So too, my brothers and sisters, is the hope and desire for us so to do when we have received and communed with God in the Holy Eucharist. It is meant to change and to transform us into living temples of the Spirit of God. As we said the other day, we, my brothers and sisters, by virtue of our baptism, have been ordained and set apart by God for God. We who have been acknowledged and accepted and recognised as children of God. Who have been made anew in Christ. Through our baptism. We then who have become holy people. A royal priesthood to serve our God. We forget, perhaps, my brothers and sisters, that we who have been baptised, we who frequently receive the sacraments of grace, have become like those sacramentals which we otherwise revere and treat respectfully. Holy water, blessed crucifixes, blessed candles, blessed ashes and palms, consecrated chalices, blessed vestments, these things which we know and recognise 
to have been made holy and set apart for the service of God, we treat with great respect. But so often we forget that we too are ourselves holy vessels. We too ourselves have been blessed and set apart to be instruments of God's will and purpose. That we have been changed and transformed. That we are not just ordinary human beings, but we have been made citizens of heaven. That we have begun the process of sanctity by being sanctified. And this, my brothers and sisters, should inform our consciences, should affect the way in which we regard ourselves, so that we do not so easily give in to our base natural instincts and carnal desires, but rather hold ourselves in check preventing ourselves from defiling that which has been made holy. That which has begun the process of perfecting the image and likeness of God within us. So often we forget as Christians that our souls, our lives, our bodies are no longer our own, but belong to God, sanctified by him, deliberately to be used and employed in his will, for his will and purpose. And as we've said before, what is his will and purpose? What is it we pray for in the Pater Noster, in the Our Father? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will. And what is God's will? But the salvation of souls. That everyone should know of his love for them. That everyone should know they exist because of his love. That they are an extension and a manifestation of his love of that charity that binds the Trinity in unity, of that energy of purity, of selflessness and sacrifice that had to create the universe in order to share its love. We, my brothers and sisters, as Christians, should have a wholly different mindset and approach to the understanding of our lives, of ourselves, and of our, our purpose. For being baptised, we have now no identity of our own, but Christ's. As the Apostle says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We now live not for ourselves, but for God. We now live not for our will, but for God's. If anyone would be a disciple of mine, let him first deny himself, take up his cross, deny himself, submit, subdue, surrender, forget his own will and replace it with God's. Recognise that his life from this moment onwards is lived for God, belongs to God, is given to God. To take up his cross to manifest and bear sacrifice, sacrificial love. The cross symbolising the divine charity for the ultimate manifestation of God's love in Christ revealed upon it. 
So our individual crosses are themselves our own sacrifices that we are bid to embrace who would follow him, who would follow Christ, who would follow his example. Who should begin to live and see the world as he saw it and as he sees it and as he intended it and as he desires it to become. So that we look at other people and we see and recognize them as children of God with the potential to know that they are children of God, with the potential to experience God's love for them, to embrace his love for them and be changed and transformed by his love for them with that same love, recognizing that they are manifestations and expressions of his love, that they exist because of his love with the intention that they might become his love and ultimately become then one with him, who is love. That we should regard and see each other as saints, as holy vessels, temples of the Holy Spirit, consecrated, ordained, set apart, blessed, sanctified. holy tools, vessels and instruments of God's will, manifesting his love, revealing something of what will one day be of that new heaven and new earth and of that resurrected life by ourselves, living in such wise as to make manifest a new way of living in Christ. Each of us daily conforming to God's will, conforming to God's law, by willingly sacrificing our will for his. See, my brothers and sisters, it is for this that Dorothy or Dorothea and Theophilus and all the martyrs and saints before us gave their lives for. This is how they understood their lives as Christians. Why so often we hear that they embraced martyrdom. Because they knew that in their sacrifice they would be united with him. My brothers and sisters, the time is surely coming where we will experience a greater persecution than that was meted out by the Ecclesian. The time is surely coming when we as Christians should be steeling ourselves to be prepared to bear witness, to bear witness in the same manner gloriously once again as those martyrs of old. Some of us, even now, have been pressed upon and called upon to make that sacrificial witness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Middle East and in Africa and in Asia, already enduring great persecution, already enduring martyrdom. And the same is coming our way here in the West. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you understand? Do you believe the kingdom of God?
to be worthy of your life. Will you make the ultimate sacrifice? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.